hello. Uh, we're here in Bucharest, and we welcome you all to this conversation on 140 years of Romanian-American diplomatic relations. We're lucky to have uh, the Deputy Secretary General of NATO, Mircea Joana, whom I'm sure most people on this call know, and also Ambassador Mark Gittenstein, who's in on the East Coast of the United States. Uh, our conversation today will uh, last one hour, and we'll leave the last 10 minutes for, converse, for questions that will be uh, posed by Raluca, who you just saw a moment ago. Right at the beginning, I want to thank on behalf of Alianza, special thanks to Oracle for their contribution to this particular uh, program. And uh, also I want to welcome and thank Dennis Dilettant, who will not be with us today, uh, one of the foremost scholars of Romanian studies, 20th century studies. And he is, uh, offers us a overview of a few minutes uh, right at the beginning of the show. And of course, the Dorian Brania in New York at the Romanian Culture Institute has done such a fabulous job and is our partner on this particular uh, broadcast. So um, let me begin with a few words of introductions to uh, Mircea Joana, whom I think you all know. He was ambassador to Washington in Clinton's day, 1996 to 2000. I think it's fair to you were the youngest ambassador in the Romanian diplomatic corps at the time and the best tennis player at the time. And uh, there following, he became uh, head of the PSD, the uh, largest party in Romania at the time, before he took up uh, his position as foreign minister from 2000 to 2004. From 2008 to 2011, he was president of the Senate. And in July of 2019, he was appointed deputy general secretary of NATO, and he joins us from Brussels. Mark Gittenstein on the East Coast. Uh, he served as ambassador from 2009 to 2012. He was nominated by President Obama in June of 2009. In fact, just before he left, President Trajan Bisescu gave him the highest civilian order, which is the star, the star of Romania. I think uh, Mark's well known for his work in fighting corruption, improving transparency, and strengthening the rule of law. He is Romanian of ancestry. His grandparents were born in Botoshan, and he attended and got degrees from Duke University and Georgetown Law School. His relationship with uh, President-elect Biden began uh, on his staff and later as chief counsel and minority chief counsel on the United States Senate Judiciary Committee. And more recently, he has served as a, a member of the transition team, the Biden Harris transition team, and he continues his work with Fondo Proprieta, which we'll discuss, I think, in, in this conversation. Anyways, I begin the first question, uh, which is an obvious question. What does Biden mean to the relations between the two countries? Well, I uh, yeah, assume that's directed to me. Uh, you know, first of all, Biden has, a, uh, Vice President Biden has a deep relationship with Romania. He has been there probably six or eight times, beginning in his time as a member of the U.S. Senate and then as chairman of the Senate Foreign Relations Committee. He was there twice uh, when he was vice president, uh, once when I was there and once after I was there. His first major foreign trip as vice president was Central Eastern Europe, and it was to Romania and Poland uh, and I think the Czech Republic. Uh, he gave his first major speech about uh, the Obama administration's relationships with Central and Eastern Europe, or on Europe generally, in Bucharest at the library. Um, so he has a deep commitment to Romania. He, uh, he encouraged me to take the Romanian post uh, primarily. He didn't tell me at the time because he and President Obama had decided to place uh, the missiles in Devisalu uh, in, in Romania, uh, you know, as part of the NATO program, which Merchant knows a lot more about than I do. Uh, and that was done, that was going to be done. I didn't realize at the time, and I think he wanted my help in trying to get uh, the treaty uh, through the Romanian Senate, which with Merchant's help, we, we were able to do quite easily. Uh, so he has, he has always looked favorably upon Romania and will continue to do so. I think he will look at Romania like every president has as an important bulwark, especially in Central and Eastern Europe. 
Mircea, you certainly uh, have had long dealings with the Democratic side of the American politics. How about, how do you see a Biden presidency in respect to Romania? Well, first of all, I think it will be a presidency where America's alliances in Europe and around the world will be, will be strengthened. Um, I think Romania uh, should be proud of our strategic partnership with the US. And I would have to say that this is you know, bipartisan, both in Romania and also in America. But what, what President-elect Biden would definitely bring would be a tremendous volume of experience in global affairs. And uh, I remember when I was a very young ambassador and he was chairing the Foreign Relations Committee, Mark, I think, uh, bringing over and over and he accepting over and over lots of guys from Romania making the pitch why Romania should join NATO. So he was very instrumental in, in, uh, in Romania and also the other countries in Central Eastern Europe accession into NATO. And by the way, the accession into NATO paved the way for the EU accession for these countries. There was, there is no other case in which uh, a European nation joined the EU before joining uh, NATO first. I remember also one thing, uh, we really, uh, and I think that's quite, quite, uh, if you want, um, his, his deep conviction that democracy, integrity, um, and checks and balances and rule of law uh, are uh, indispensable parts of a, of a prosperous and successful uh, society. And I remember being invited when he visited, I think the second time, Mark, uh, the first time I met him personally at the American embassy, um, I have a photo here in my office in NATO with, with him. Um, but the second time he had a speech and he had a, you know, a small quote, uh, speaking of the fight against corruption and the need for integrity for Romania and for any other nation. He was referring to Alexander Ioan Cusa and for Romanians, uh, uh, this conversation of, uh, of the Romanian Domnitor of those times with a, uh, with a peasant, uh, speaking of Okawa, uh, Okawa Mika, uh, he, he made a very powerful, uh, powerful Romanian, uh, if you want, metaphor uh, in, this, in this thing. So I believe he will be bringing tremendous uh, predictability. I think he will be investing in, his, in, in America's alliances. And Romania's strategic partnership, I think, will flourish uh, even more with Joe Biden and Kamala Harris uh, at the helm of the American administration. That's a very optimistic and encouraging beginning. Uh, I want to then just before we, since we're talking about 140 years, to turn to Dennis Dilettant's pre-recorded message. Uh, Uluka, do you have it there? I... Yes, yes, I do. Okay, let, let it roll then. And then... I'm going to say a few words about the history of uh, US-Romanian relations. So according to the, its practice in European matters, the US government waited until France, Britain and Germany recognized Romania's independence on the 20th of February, 1880. Uh, it was only then that the US opened the legation in Bucharest. The first Romanian minister to the US Constantin Angelescu presented his letters of accreditation at the White House on the 15th of January, 1918. After the First World War, the US reverted to its policy of isolation in international affairs, that the US remained neutral until the declaration of war on Japan following the attack on Pearl Harbor on the 7th of December, 1941. Romania declared war on the US on the 12th of December, 1941. But it was only on the 5th of June, 1942, that the United States declared war on Romania, Hungary and Bulgaria. Romania's leader, Gheorghe Udej, embarked upon a policy of autonomy from the Soviet Union after 1956. The country reached out to the West to consolidate its commercial and cultural relations. Nicolae Ceausescu, on succeeding Gheorghe Udej, continue, continued to place what he regarded as Romania's interest above that of the Kremlin. Growing recognition of Romania's political usefulness as a thorn in the flesh of the Soviet Union 
prompted a period of increasing Western courtship of Ceausescu, exemplified by President Nixon's visit in August 1969. In 71, Romania was, in, was admitted to the General Agreement on Trade and Tariffs, so-called GATT, and in 1972, it was accepted into the International Monetary Fund and the World Bank. Throughout the 1970s, Romania expanded its foreign trade relations with the West to a greater degree than any other country in the East Central European bloc. That at the end of July 1975, President Ford granted Romania most favored nation tariff status. In March 1985, the Western support for Ceausescu faded. With the event of advent of Gorbachev in the Soviet Union, Ceausescu's usefulness as a bridge between East and West rapidly evaporated. In July 1988, Ceausescu renounced the most favored nation trade concessions in the face of White House on, and congressional demands for improved human rights performance. And from that date, Romania, uh, Ceausescu's notoriety, we might say, in the US uh, descended rapidly. And ultimately, uh, we have, of course, the revolution of December 1989 and the uh, execution of Ceausescu on Christmas Day 1989 and the beginning with the collapse of communism of a new era in US-Romanian relations. Good, okay. Well, there's an overview. There's a longer version of that will be on the other platforms for about 11 minutes. But in any ways, it allows the diplomats at, at, on this conversation to put on their historical hats a little bit. And I wanted to ask the question that in some way, Romanian-American relations have always been constructive. Obviously, World War I, World War II, at least at the end, uh, even in the Ceausescu period, of course, 1969, and then after 89, it's in a funny way, it always seems to ha have a way of working itself out in a pragmatic way. Mircea uh, and, and Mark, let's get your take on, on that. Why is that? Mircea, why don't you go first? Oh, thanks, Mark. Um, listen, um, when I arrived uh, in 1996, the main ambassador to Washington, the first job at hand was to get the MFN status back to Romania. Ceausescu gave up, and by the way, Denis Dalatant is a wonderful intellectual and historian, and uh, we love him and respect him greatly. And uh, that was the, and it was an attempt in 1995 by, by Romania, uh, which failed in US Congress to take it back. So I'm just trying to tell you that the level of Romanian US relationship uh, after a very hesitant Romanian transition after 89, 1989 was at a very low point very low point. Reputational was not very clear. Uh, while other countries were speaking about getting into NATO, Romania was fighting to get MFN status back. Us and, and North Korea were in that situation. But in the end, um, uh, we turned it around. Uh, I remember vividly, you know, the big, the big billboard uh, uh, in, the, in, in, in the House of Representatives with the votes. I think we got roughly 95% uh, of the votes for, for that. What I'm trying to make uh, the point is that uh, history is not linear. Uh, there are moments in history uh, where dramatic things happen and inflection points uh, do occur. And I think if you want the merit of Romanian diplomats and political leaders over time were able to grasp such uh, opportunities. Uh, my experience with the great moments is uh, the strategic partnership between Romania and US itself. To be honest, because we plotted this uh, in 1999 after Romania suffered a tactical defeat by not being invited uh, to join NATO at the Madrid summit. So basically it was two or three of us with Strobe Talbot and Ron Asmus and myself in a small room someplace inventing the strategic partnership. So there was no preordained uh, destiny uh, for this thing. We just were able to grasp a moment, a difficult moment, and turn a tactical defeat into a strategic victory for Romania. And if today we have a strategic partnership which is flourishing, it's also because of a certain more difficult moment. So not everything is rosy. 
not everything is preordained. You have to fight when destiny, history, geography gives you a chance. And you have, when you have it to get it, you can, you get it. And that's, that's I think, my, 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 my lesson from, from this thing. And I anticipate a long, long history of exceptionally close alliance between Romania and US. No matter what will happen with other things, I do anticipate long, long, long historical cycle of, of an alliance between Romania and the US. I think that's right. You were saying that history is not linear in your answer, Mitra. Do you see anything that would get in the way of the flow, which has been, a, despite the ups and downs you talked about, which has nonetheless been more or less in one direction? Do you see any scenarios that could upset that? I think the alliance between America and Europe between America and Romania, between America and its allies uh, in many corners of the world is based, based on two ingredients. One is common values and the other one is common strategic interests. So as long as Romania, and I, I, I'm convinced that Romania will stay the course, irrespective of the sometimes you slide, there are hesitations, there are mistakes, there are things. As long as Romania uh, continues to invest in its democratic system, as long as we share the same values, the long, as long as we also share common strategic, economic, and political interests, I think this relationship is, is, is sound, is solid, and is deepening and broadening uh, uh, with every cycle. And this is why my anticipation for the new American administration and the new American Congress, that, and, and for Romanian leadership and Romanian parliament and Romanian um, you know, citizens, is for us to continue to invest in this indispensable relationship for Romania, that there's the indispensable relationship for Romania is this partnership and alliance with the US. Mark, what's your thoughts? Any thoughts on that? Yeah, I, um, a number of them. First of all, I agree with everything Mark just said. Um, and first of all, the other thing I should have said this at the beginning, you know, I don't speak for the United States anymore. I'm not the US ambassador. And I don't speak for the for the incoming, forthcoming Biden administration either on these issues. I speak just as a citizen who has devoted much of my last, of the last decade to this, uh, this group of issues. But I think one reason the Alliance is so strong uh, picks up on uh, points that Mercer was making. Uh, I remember when they were trying to, when, when I heard how the decision was made to place the missiles uh, in, in Romania, uh, that, you know, are in Devisela now. I, I was, it was explained to me how they went through the process of settling on Romania. And I won't go into the other two or three countries they looked at. But once you sat down and had to make a strategic decision about which country in this region of NATO is most important and reliable as an ally, it was, it was not even close, okay? Uh, first of all, Romania, I don't know if people are aware of this, but you know the German Marshall Fund does a, a survey, I believe it's a German Marshall Fund every uh, year, uh, uh, sort of gauging uh, American support in every country in Europe, especially in NATO. And Romania frequently, I think even today, is the country where America is the most popular. So there's a deep well of support and kinship among the Romanian people about America. And you know, although Romania is not well enough known in the United States, and that's something Jim and I have been focusing on in creating Alianza, uh, among elites, especially in the State Department and the military, flag officers, by the way, I had a flag officer in my office once a month from NATO or, or US, uh, US Army Europe or um, uh, you know, any uh, the US Navy, sort of reassuring and, re, uh, and strengthening relations between the US military and Romania. Almost every month I was in uh, as an ambassador. Uh, so at almost every level at, at the, among the elite civil service in the United States there's a deep recognition of the importance of Romania. Uh, and uh, you know, no matter who the US ambassador is, I think Jim would agree with this. And I spent much time talking to Alan Moses and Jim and Michael Guest Nick Taubman before I became ambassador, it was clear to me that the staff that we would inherit as ambassadors and the infrastructure within the State Department always emphasized the importance of Romania militarily, politically, strategically to the United States. And when I got to Romania, it became clear to me that we shared many values, 
on democracy, uh, culturally, uh, and in attitudes about the East. And uh, I think that's, th there are inherent immutable forces strengthening that relationship no matter what. Now, I agree with Mircea, there are things that could happen in Romania that would undermine that relationship. And that is, that is always a, a consistent concern to us. And one reason why every US ambassador from Al Moses to the, to the present has emphasized anti-corruption and transparency is because we view that as an essential ingredient to a stable democracy, which in turn is critical to a enduring alliance with an ally you can trust. Um, thank you. Mircea, you were talking about the, the rough points here and there, and you, Mark, just mentioned immutable forces that move in the good direction. When you were serving Mircea in Washington and Mark in Bucharest, did you ever get to a point where you said they just don't understand what we're, what we're looking, looking for? There's some misunderstanding here. Did you ever have that type of problem when you were serving on the ground in the other country? Mark. You want me to go first? Yeah. Uh, well, it was often around the issues of corruption and, and transparency. It, it was almost as if, and I, as many of you know, I was attacked consistently about this as if I was serving some personal interest here. And by the way, it continues to this day because of my work on Fondue Appropriate which is, I, I got on that board primarily because it became a platform for me to continue to advocate, advocate for greater transparency especially in equity markets and, and reform of state-owned enterprises, which are, of course, as you know, is the portfolio of Fondue Appropriatate, that often I would get in arguments with people about why, why do you advocate this? Why do you care about this? And I, and I always would say, look, we can't want this more than you do, but the reason we want this is because we believe it is inherent to a stable democracy that you have a rule of law and that uh, politics, which in, in Romania, and increasingly, by the way, in the United States has become increasingly what I call tribal, which is less concerned about principle and stewardship of the, of the government and the democracy and more about personal interest. That's dangerous and, and it basically will destroy a democracy and makes a country unstable. And we don't want an unstable Romania. And besides, you know, for me as a Romanian, uh, with, because of my Romanian ancestry, I have a deep uh, commitment to the country when it's, and its success. So, but no matter whether you're a Romanian ancestry or not, if you're a US ambassador, that's what you're worried about. Mircea, when you were in Washington, horse trading with Congress or uh, House, so forth, did you feel you sometimes dealt with people that didn't quite understand what Romania was about, what you, what you were after? No, I think it's, it's, um, it's one of the most formidable uh, challenges uh, from a smaller country to come to the biggest country in the world and try to make the case for Romania. Yeah. Why Romania? Why Romania into NATO? Why? President Biden, I remember, was asking the Romanian Joint Chiefs visiting him in the, in the US Senate, why should our sons and daughters die for Romania, defending Romania? I mean, these kind of relatively fundamental questions um, and where there is the mix uh, between values, integrity, but also a sense, a sense of, you know, a sense of catching up with the historical lost time that Romania was unfortunately uh, obliged in, in, in doing. But what's, what's interesting about America that the people are so open. You know, the question is difficult to get to them. And I think the Romanian state should buy me shoes in perpetuity for free for uh, the souls I have basically broken running on the corridors of US Congress, talking to any staffer, to anybody who was interested in listening about Romania, that he or she were my guys. I remember speaking of the Veselu uh, with uh, Sergio Medar, who was the uh, defense attaché at that time. We were <laughs> going on the hill with maps uh, of potential Iranian missiles across Europe. And of course, uh, as Mark said, Romania is, is an obvious strategic place. But in America, there is this fantastic illusion for an ambassador or diplomats from smaller countries 
that they can really play major league, even if the country doesn't have all the ingredients of playing, playing major league. If you work hard, if you're relentless, if you never give up, if you, as a Romanian say, uh, saying goes, they throw you uh, out the door, you come back through the window. Uh, I remember uh, in, in, in mobilizing the Romanian American community was also another exceptional feat for me because we are so desperate to get into NATO that we started to cross America and, and go to Romanian churches, Romanian communities. And I have to say they mobilized exceptionally well. We had a petition signed by, I think, 120,000 Romanian Americans for uh, the White House and US Congress. When I arrived, uh, there was only honorary consulate, one that your dad, Radu Florescu, God bless his soul, a great Romanian, a great patriot, was the only honorary consul we had in Boston. When I left, we had 20 honorary consulates. So if, if a country understands the importance of the relationship with America, and everybody around the world understands that, and you start really mobilizing everything you have and you do and you're relentless, in, in, the, end, in the end, you succeed. That's the lesson from America, that everything is possible. Probably uh, Romania will not become a G7 country anytime soon. I'm, I'm sorry, at least in my lifetime. But it doesn't mean that if you play your cards right, if you're serious, if you're um, you know, predictable. If you really uh, invest in, in, in this relationship that Romania is not, and today Romania is a very trusted ally and partner of America, and this is something good. This is also helping us in Europe, helping us in the neighborhood, helping us around the world. So that's great about America, that people are very open. The moment you get to talk to them, they, they are easygoing and and that's what I love about talking to American, not only politicians or diplomats, but also to American citizens. They are exceptionally open and ready to, to, to listen to your arguments, if you have any, of course. Thank you. Thank you. That's a very nice word about my dad. I was just looking at his, uh, his work, and he pointed out that the first diplomatic relations occurred by the governor, then the governor, or to become governor of Virginia, Captain John Smith, who went to Alba Iulia, in 1615, so we have really more than 140 years, but it goes back a long time. You were mentioning the thing, Mircea, about open. Mircea, how about you, I mean, Mark, how about you when you were in Bucharest? What was the thing that sort of caught your eye about the character or the quality, the special quality of uh, Romanian people? Well, first of all, they're very warm people. Uh, they could be also be hotheads. <laughs> there could be, uh, uh, but you know they're they're very rarely mean spirited, and uh, I was welcomed with open arms in Romania. And I think what was you know it was the first Romanian American ever to hold the job as U.S. ambassador, and people you know people were excited about that. And uh, and before I could even say a word, many of them would actually say that to me, and it made me feel really good. I remember uh, I used to you know I I, I love the cultural. Uh, opportunities in Bucharest and in, in particular. And I was at the Athenaeum one night at a piano concert uh, recital. And I remember turning around and looking at the people and they all looked familiar, even though they weren't related to me. And I think it's because I was Romanian. I mean, the other story I love to tell is when I went to Botoshan for I think the first or second time, the mayor there, I can't remember who it was at the time, introduced me to, um, I think I told the story on that videotape I did the other day uh, and said, you know, I want to welcome you to Bodishan. And I interrupted him. My wife always gets nervous when I do that. And I say, I hate to uh, contradict you, your honor, but you're not, you're welcoming me to my uh, ancestral home. And, uh, you know, and uh, I feel home at home here. And I always did feel at, at home uh, in Romania. So, um, uh, I think that was the other thing is, you know, just look out this window here is, you know, Romania looks like the United States or like what I remember the United States. This, you could be in the Danube Delta here looking out this window. Beautiful wetlands and in the mountains of uh, the Rockies. Uh, you know, I have a, a house, um, I live actually most of the time in Seattle and the Cascades are behind me and that could be the Carpathian Alps. So it, it physically looked the same, the people felt you know, like they shared our, I know they shared our values and they certainly shared our aspirations. So uh, I felt at home in Romania. I still do. Felt at home. And then, uh, let me ask you a question, Mark. You know, we, almost in literature and history, people always talk about the shadowy ways 
by which Romania operates or the Balkans. Did you ever feel that dealing with in, let's say, in a with the political world? Oh, yes, absolutely. It's a very Byzantine politics. Uh, but, uh, you know, there are people like Mercia and other reformers who have made a difference in Romania. And I think the trend line, as Dr. King used to say, the arc of justice, the arc of time history bends towards justice. And I think the arc of history of America, of Romanian politics is towards greater democracy and a closer uh, connection with the West. Uh, but I also agree with Mercia, it's not inevitable. Nothing, you know, as we've learned in the last four years here in the United States, uh, you know, reform and expansion of a multicultural democracy is not inevitable in the United States and it's not inevitable in Romania. Both of you as diplomats carried the ball down the field and you've both talked about that. Mutual with the difficulties of MFM and things like, and other uh, challenges there. Is there anything, let's say, I'll begin with you, uh, Mark, unfinished business that I wish I just got this job done a little bit more, push, push the Well, hand. you know, uh, to use an American expression, I broke a lot of eggs over the issue of corruption. And I'm very proud of the fact that I, I did that. Uh, I want to continue to do work in that space. Uh, and I think that the reason I joined the Fondul board was because one of the, my great regrets as ambassador is I didn't think I did enough to help reform equity markets and make businesses and state-owned enterprises more transparent. Because what I learned about corruption is you can't just you know, indict and convict everybody in Romania. That doesn't solve the problem. You have to make structural changes to make corruption less enticing and less inevitable. And I learned that state-owned enterprises were the venue for a lot of mismanagement, uh, lack of transparency, and corruption, quite frankly. Uh, and the problem with that is those enterprises are basically owned by Romanians. <laughs> By Romanian shareholders or voters. And you know, Romanian pension funds own huge swaths of these, either through Fondu Proprietate or directly to some of these uh, um, entities. And they need to be reformed. It's the essential uh, next step in ending a command and control economy is to uh, bring equity markets and greater transparency into the management of the economy generally, but certainly. Of, um, uh, of the state-owned enterprises. And in any emerging democracy, creating wealth has to come uh, through building equity markets, through IPOs and other activities. Uh, you can't, the banks cannot finance reform by themselves. It has to come through investment. Uh, that's why Poland, until, at least until recently, was quite successful in this space. They built their equity markets. And I always thought that that was my, I didn't do enough in that space. And so it's one reason I have spent so much time uh, at Fondo Proprietate. Mircea, how about you, unfinished business? Listen, um, many of the, let's say the anchors uh, of the Romanian American relationship, the strategic partnership itself, um, uh, the Romanian caucus on Capitol Hill, um, the things that were started before me, the National Guard uh, of Alabama and Romania. Uh, I remember uh, managing to convince uh, US Congress to invite uh, former President Constantinescu to a joint, uh, to, to a joint address in front of the uh, US Congress, a joint session of Congress, which I hope next Romanian presidents will be able to, to, to replicate. But wh wh where I feel that we have done, done all, all of us, enough of a good job from Romania, I mean, irrespective of the, uh, of the political affiliation and whatever, and the Byzantine politics of, of Romania, that's, that's the culture of the land. I think we have not moved aggressively enough towards a comprehensive strategy of engaging America in its depth. So I think we just rely on, uh, you know, how many visits do we have? And by the way, uh, uh, since President Clinton, President G.W. Bush and Vice President Biden, we didn't have much of high level visit to Romania. 
But I think what's, what I believe we should try to do is to understand that America is a huge country. It's a complex country. And not, nothing that you have achieved is given to you in perpetuity. You have to invest. It's a very asymmetrical relationship. A huge global superpower and a medium-sized power, of course, relevant, important in the region. But I think that we have not been able to have a method of engaging America and engaging also American public opinion, American newspapers, opinion makers, think tanks. There is no Romanian presence, physical presence in one think tank in Washington as we speak. These are things that I believe for me are things that need to be corrected. And if there is something I can you know, say about myself that I was probably when I had important political positions in Romania, there was not even myself able to convince my Colleagues, I hope that the new Romanian parliament, because there is an, uh, a pro-America caucus in the Romanian parliament, they will be in the position to engage the new US, new U.S. Congress and broaden the caucus on Romania. So what I think that relying only on your military uh, colleagues uh, and your intel colleagues and, and you, you have to invest much more. America is a huge country. You have to invest, you know, far more professionally and far more in a diversified way. Uh, if you want to have real influence and enduring influence, uh, not only in Washington, but across America, from Seattle, <laughs> speaking of, of Mark, uh, all the way to Florida and from the uh, Midwest all the way to California, you, you, you have to be always on campaign mode. With America, you have always to be on campaign mode because the country is too big and too complex just to wait for presidents or prime ministers or a few diplomats to do the job. All of us have to do the job. A wider, it needs a wider footing. Now that's, I suppose, a question for both of you that under the Obama administration, Obama seemed like he had pivoted towards the, towards the, towards the Pacific and, uh, and Vice President Biden was deputized, it seemed more than most to be looking after Europe. Do you think that becomes more difficult now? Um, and I know you have both different perspectives on it. Mark, you're being a Biden man, and Mircea, you're seeing it from both sides now, and also NATO. Will it be more difficult to get a Biden administration um, to keep their eyes on Europe, or will it follow in the, in the, in the Obama uh, pivot? What do you think, Mircea? No, I don't, I don't think uh, that uh, a Biden administration will basically not engage with Europe, which is just the opposite. If I understand correctly from uh, also from the foreign affairs piece that President uh, elect Biden has published, what also I hear from uh, from some of his uh, of his colleagues, that he will be trying to basically coalesce all American alliances around the world. And then you have 30 nations, 29 American allies, 28 because Canada and US are North America, you start with Europe because that's the backbone of your alliances. So what I think will, will happen, we'll see a strengthening of America's alliances with Europe in NATO, uh, and also uh, with like-minded nations from all over the world, mainly Asia Pacific, with Australia, with Japan, with Korea, uh, with New Zealand, with India. Um, so I, I believe that uh, the transatlantic bond will, be, will remain very vibrant and developed, I'm not concerned about this. I think that also Europe has to understand that the rise of China uh, is a challenge also for us. So I think when President Biden will come for the NATO summit uh, sometime next year, and also when he will be engaging the EU leadership also sometime next year, we'll have clarity, but I'm, I'm confident uh, and convinced uh, that the transatlantic bond will continue to be, uh, the, if you want the essential component one of American uh, global, uh, democratic engagement. Uh, Mark, I, to what, well, so, let me. I, can yeah. I respond to that? First yeah. of all, uh, again, I re-emphasize I'm speaking for myself, not from for the United States or for the Obama administration. But I strongly agree with what uh, Mercha said. I wanted to pick up on a point that Mercha made earlier, and then I'll come back to this to your question, John. Uh, actually, Mercha and I talked a little bit about this when I was ambassador and uh, Pan Demichescu also was pushing me on this as well. And that is the Romanian American community is not well organized in the United States. 
And uh, I don't know how Merchant was able to do what he did, but uh, you know, we have worked at Alianza for that very purpose to try and strengthen uh, the bonds of Romanian American organizations with each other <laughs> and have them all rowing in the same direction uh, and uh, towards a strengthening of the relationship between the two countries in the United States. I'll never forget, I think it may have been President Vicescu or somebody asked me sort of annoyed at one point about why was it so hard for Romania to get eight M16s when Poland had, you know, like 24 F-16s. And I said to whoever it was, I said, you know what the largest Polish city in the world is outside of Warsaw? Chicago, okay? And they are very well organized and they can get the attention of people on the Hill and an administration much better than you do. And I think you need to build that uh, wellspring of support. And that's what we have been trying to do at Alianza and it's extremely important. Uh, but anyhow, I took us off a little on the sideline, but I thought Mercer's point was, was, was right and needed to be reemphasized. And it's the whole purpose of Alianza to try and do that. But John, I interrupted you. You had another question no, you were no, asking. Actually, you raised another interesting point because I remember you know, when Obama first ran for, for the office, Rado and I were in charge of Romanian Americans for Obama. And I was always struck at how many people, how many Romanian Americans were not that big on Democrats. It's sort of like a new... Uh, there's a new kind of Romanian American that uh, is somewhat detached, somewhat um, politicized, or maybe even depoliticized. Do you have any thoughts on that, particularly in light of the fact that you mentioned this thing about a, a non-united Romanian community? Uh, well, I think uh, to give credit where credit's due for, you know, I don't know if it's totally fair, but it's certainly the perception in Romania and with many uh, immigrant groups in the United States that, who care about Russia <laughs> is that they credit Ronald Reagan with bringing down uh, the Iron Curtain. And, uh, and to that extent, as we know, that is a very, those, that cluster of issues around uh, the Warsaw Pact and, Ru and the Soviet Union, not necessarily Russia today, but some of Russia today, uh, Ronald Reagan gets the credit for doing that. Now, in fairness, it st actually started with Harry Truman uh, with building NATO, et cetera, as, as Murcher can tell you. I mean, there's a long history of this that it's actually not partisan. But the president that many Romanians, I think, credit with doing that was Reagan and the Republican Party. Now, as you know, Biden was heavily, if there was a Democrat who cared as deeply as Reagan about that, that was probably uh, then Senator Joe Biden. So I think that's part of it. Uh, and, uh, you know, we'll see where it goes in the future. I'm, as Murchie, is quite optimistic about where we're headed. Yuji, you were talking a moment ago about the Pacific and China and the interest of Europe and the United States. Um, would you see NATO playing a different role in trying to kind of uh, soften the rise of China in collaboration with the United States? Do you see an, an opportunity to step up that game? Listen, uh, NATO leaders in London last year uh, decided and instructed us to, to look more carefully into the implications on security, because that's what NATO is all about, of the rise of China. And we do this. We do this and we'll continue to do this because it's a, it's a major superpower that has explicit ambitions to become number one in the world, not only in terms of economy, but also in terms of military and technology. And as we know, there is always a relationship between, between the economy, the technology, and, and, uh, and military prowess. Today, China is, uh, uh, is having the second largest defense budget in the world after the US. And that's why uh, I come back to, to, the, to the need of alliances. You know, if you look at NATO, the 30 countries in NATO, the 30 allies in NATO, we still have 50% of global GDP and more than 50% of defense spending in the world. And that's why I, I, I believe that uh, like-minded nations should, should look into the rise of China also as an opportunity, because there's a major market. Uh, there's also opportunities to, to do things with them. Hopefully, uh, they will be playing a constructive role when it comes to world order. Uh, but when it comes to the challenges uh, of, rise of, of the rise of China, we are, we are, of course, very attentive and we, we do our homework. 
making sure. And we are not getting closer to NATO, closer to China. They are coming close to us. I with see. Silk and Road Initiative, Belt and Road Initiative, when in, uh, you know, purchasing uh, critical infrastructures in Europe, uh, being present in our neighborhoods. So in a way, uh, it's something that we are, we are, uh, you know, it's, uh, it's an obligation for a security and, uh, and defense alliance to look into a global shift in geopolitics and geoeconomics and defense uh, capabilities. So of that course, doesn't mean that it doesn't mean that Russia doesn't continue to be a major concern to all of us. Look at the kind of new generation of missiles, and uh, they just finished a major nuclear exercise just the other day. Um, but uh, China's rise is probably the most important uh, evolution in geopolitics in in probably in, if not decades, in centuries probably since the preeminence of the West uh, uh, half a millennia ago. Do you think that Biden's election will signal a deepening of relationships in the, from NATO to Japan, Australia, South Korea, and maybe New Zealand? Do you see that that gives a renewed spark to deepen those relationships? I think it will. Uh, we already have a very strong partnership between NATO and these four Asia-Pacific partners. We, they are exceptionally close to us. Uh, in the last few uh, foreign ministers meetings of NATO and defense ministers meeting of NATO, we had uh, also the foreign and defense ministers of Australia attending some of the sessions that we do. We engage actively with those. Um, uh, we're also looking into what the U.S. is building into, into the uh, Asia-Pacific, Indo-Pacific, also the openings with, with India. So I anticipate, yes, that uh, not only Asia-Pacific, but also I think around the world, and the idea of President-elect Biden to have a, a summit of, uh, of democracies is also something that makes a lot of sense. Uh, because in the end, I come back to what unites all of us, which is our values. And China is not reflecting our values. China is promoting a different type of societal model, which is not our open, free, and, and democratic society model. Mark, what do you, what's your view on that? Well, I, you know, look, I... I, I, as there are certain immutable strategic imperatives that drive the relationship between Romania and the United States, they, it's also true between the EU and the United States. And a, large, a lot of it is economic. I mean, I think the United States is probably the largest trading partner with the EU. I don't know if the converse is true, but it's pretty close to true. Uh, and you know, the ties are very deep. Uh, both economically and culturally, and uh, because of NATO, militarily and strategically. So there's an inevitability to it. No matter what anybody wanted, we would be driven towards our relationships with the UK and the EU. Uh, and um, I'm, I, I'm not worried about this concern about the pivot towards Asia. You have to pay a lot of attention uh, to Asia, if for no other reason, the one that Merchant mentioned, it's got the second largest military in the world, and it's forward-leaning as to what it wants to do. It is a strategic competitor of the United States. Mitchell, you mentioned a moment ago Turkey, and of course, Turkey just purchased uh, these S-400 air defense systems. How concerned are you about that, given the fact that even a few years ago, there's so much talk of Turkey coming into the family of NATO? Listen, we, we raised this, this issue with our uh, Turkish allies, and I, Secretary General Stoltenberg raised it also directly in Ankara just, I think, two or three weeks ago. I did it this morning in a, in a video chat with, with, uh, with some of the Turkish representatives. Um, I think this is something that, uh, uh, of course, it's a sovereign decision of Turkey to, to purchase whatever, uh, you know, equipments they, they deem appropriate for them. But when it comes to NATO, and our common defense system, a missile defense system, uh, uh, we believe that uh, the acquisition of this Russian missile defense system is number one, uh, uh, totally different, will never be accepted as part of the NATO defense system. And I think that uh, Turkey should try to find, even if it's relatively late in the game, some alternative solutions. Uh, that would be Western technology and compatible with NATO interoperability standards. We're moving up to uh, the question time in a couple of minutes. I just wanted to put you back as ambassadors and uh, ask to think back some many years ago. 
And what did you learn from your American experience, Mircha, where you thought, I wish we had a little bit more of this ingredient in Romanian life? And I'll ask the inverse question to Mark. For me, optimism, optimism um, and uh, a sense that the sky is the limit. I think sometimes Romanians, including myself, sometimes we tend to underestimate ourselves. The country is a great potential. The country has, as Mark has said, wonderful people, smart, hardworking. If you put them in the right context, they perform like, like, like crazy. I think sometimes we, we lack a little bit of, of this sense of optimism and a sense of self-confidence. Um, if we correct that a little bit, I think the sky is the limit. Mark, on your end, skies are almost a mischief and we have a little more confidence. Well, first, first let me add to what Mercer said. I, I used to give a speech. I think Mercer heard me give it when I was in America. And that one of the problems with Romanians is that's the Viasa. Nothing can change. Everything's going to be the same. And, you know, I said, <clears throat> I think you need a little more of Obama's yes, we can. And I agree, I agree very <laughs> fundamentally with uh, Mercer about that. But I've seen a lot of change in that respect in the last 10 years, but for the better. I, I don't know for the, what I always appreciated about Romanians, which I wish we saw more in the United States was a true appreciation of her history. And the people that, that I spent time with and I admired the most in Romania, the reformers really appreciated the value of democracy and the rule of law. And they cared a lot about it. The ones that, that I dealt with, you know, the investigative reporters, the reformers, the people in the parties who cared about reform, the prosecutors, and many judges, I know there's at least one or two of the judges on the call, I can tell from chats back and forth who are listening. And I really truly admire them. And I, you know, I think in America now there's more appreciation of this than when I left Romania in 2012. And that is our democracy is fragile and we can lose it. Romanians understand that intuitively. They have lost their democracy and regained it, okay? Uh, and, you know, I think we in America now understand that better than we did in 2012. And uh, I think with the election of, um, of Joe Biden as president, we have seen that our institutions are quite resilient and can survive challenges, but they can't survive them forever. And uh, uh, they are more fragile than we think. Since uh, both you two have been out of town and I've been in town, you'd be pleased to know that Obama's book is selling very well at Kauteresh all over town and translated beautifully in Romanian. Mircea, you were mentioning the thing about the openness, which is a, a subject and the qualities and transparency that you always stress at the Aspen, at the Aspen Institute, uh, Institute meetings in Bucharest. Now turning slightly to the future, just before we take a few questions, What's the unfinished business for Biden? And maybe you've touched on this in, in, round, in roundabout ways. Unfinished business for the 46th president. Mark, we'll start with you since he, he just paid you a visit. Uh, well, I, I, as again, I don't speak for Biden uh, on this. I just speak for myself. I think, that, I think he would recognize that as far as Romania is concerned, is that what you're asking? You know, what's yeah. the unfinished? I think it's what I talked about. Uh, it's continuing to strengthen the relationship both militarily and culturally. And again, continuing to strengthen and deepen the democracy, <coughs> both as a rule of law and in terms of free markets. <coughs> Mircea, what would you like to see as the, the agenda on his desk <laughs> in Romania? You know, I'm not in the position to, uh, to, to speculate on, on this thing. But I, I do know that uh, he's, President Biden's uh, deep, deep uh, and sophisticated knowledge uh, of our region and of Europe and international affairs will benefit us greatly. So my case would be for the Romanian decision makers is to, to, to take this opportunity and use it uh, to its utmost. It's not only up to the American president or American uh, secretary of state or, or uh, the head of the Pentagon or whatever, or US Congress to do. It's also for, as I mentioned, it's an asymmetrical relationship. Yeah. And a smaller partner has always to be creative and, 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 and invest and use this opportunity because I think they'll be open to smart, articulated, uh, serious uh, arguments coming from Bucharest and from Romania 
to move this alliance between the two countries to the next level. That's my ambition, to see an, uh, an American president visiting Romania in the next uh, uh, years, uh, uh, which uh, I remember uh, being with President Clinton, with President UW Bush. I hope that Romanians will see an American president visiting Romania in the next years, if it's possible. It's up to the Romanians to play ball. Don't expect everything to come from the other side. Yeah, you, you have to play your cards. Romania has cards to play. And they, I think Romania should play those cards. Very uh, positive uh, message. Um, now, I just want to turn to some questions. Raluca, do you have some questions for us? Um, we actually have a number of really good questions that came in. Um, and um, because our time is limited, I wanted to apologize in advance for not being able to get to everybody's questions, but um, please do um, uh, visit our website at alianza.org and follow us on social media. Um, we want to be able to continue this conversation and hopefully if we don't get to all of your questions now, um, uh, keep it interactive and uh, continue to communicate with everybody and answer everybody's questions. Um, I have the first question for Mr. Joanna from George Roth, who uh, happens to be um, the honorary consul of Romania in uh, San Francisco. Uh, the question is, you are the ambassador who basically created the network of honorary consul uh, court of Romania, where I am a member of. You created more than 20 honorary consuls in the US. My question is, how did you get this idea? Was somebody, uh, uh, did somebody suggest this to you? Romania didn't have a tradition about this at all. Uh, hello, George. I look forward to, uh, and also your son is, a, uh, is an Aspen uh, fellow. He went to the leadership programs of our institute. Um, uh, I, I think I did it out of despair. We are so desperate to catch up uh, with Poland uh, and Hungary and the Czech Republic to get into NATO and the others that we had basically to, to build from scratch. Of course, there are other countries that have even a, a, you know, a, even broader network of Hungary consulates. I think there are countries that have consulates in every single American state. But it was basically a, an investment in a network, let's put it openly, of influence. And some of them were uh, Romanian Americans. Others were just Americans that have an interest in Romania. So uh, uh, I think that also to, to, to tell you the, the whole thing, also Sorin Dukaru, who was Mike's successor as ambassador to Washington, has also done a, a fantastic job in also continuing to push for this. So if I would be in the situation to recommend to, uh, to, the, to the Romanian diplomats that will be in charge of this leadership, go and have a honorary council in every single American state. We have to travel. Thank you. Um, okay. we, uh, a question for uh, Mark uh, from Brian Jardine. Do you anticipate the incoming Biden administration will promote Romania as a viable investment market for US companies, particularly in such industries where Romania has a competitive advantage like IT, TMT, um, such that assuming Romania remains committed to anti-corruption and rule of law, we will witness an increased level of U.S. foreign direct investment into Romania over the next four years. Well, uh, first of all, uh, great to hear from you, Brian. Uh, Brian is a dear friend, uh, and I've talked to him at length about these issues. Um, you know, if you were to ask me, what would I rather have, uh, you know, a couple hundred million dollars worth of direct investment in the United States or having President Biden come to Eucharist, I would choose the former. And I think the former, uh, I think that's more important to have Romania become a destiny for uh, a serious US investment. And by the way, I think one reason why of the $2 billion in uh, investment in the Fondo Appropriatate, a substantial portion of that is American is because they trust Fondo Appropriatate as a transparent and well-run safe place to put money to enter the Romanian market. The Romanian market is naturally uh, attractive because of the talent of the workforce and the assets that could be purchased. The only barrier to investment in, the, in Romania right now is the lack of transparency in certain of these institutions. And to the extent you open your markets and you make them more transparent, 
uh, that will attract more investment. And why is that good for Romania? Not only does it make more money available and more jobs available for young Romanians, but especially when investments are made in state-owned enterprises, it makes the, the Romanian investments in those institutions more valuable. Take Hydroelectrica, for example. Uh, Fondo Proprietate only owns 20% of Hydroelectrica, but every time we do something to reform Hydroelectrica, which is, by the way, one of the great success stories in Romania, the 80%, which is owned by Romanians, increases in value by the same percentage. And to the extent you open these institutions to greater investment, you will increase the share value that Romanians own in these companies. Uh, and I think it's extremely important that there be greater transparency to attract greater investment. So I strongly agree with the implication of Brian's question. Um, Ruluca, I think I'm gonna step in because I promised both our guests not to take more than an hour. And this is a, a really a fascinating, I'd call it a highly personalized analysis by friends of Romania and for Romanians. So it's a friend, it was a real treat, I think, for everybody watching. I wanna thank once again, Oracle and obviously the Romanian Culture Institute for getting this as far and wide as possible. So thank you all for, the, for your time. It was superb and enjoyable and interesting. Bye-bye. Thanks, John. Bye now.